hello YouTube, we're back, we're uh, now in Glace Bay, Nova Scotia, we're uh, taking you guys on a trip today, we're going to head down into a coal mine and show you what that's all about. Hey. So we'll catch you when we get there guys, see you in a bit. We're now in the building guys, we're uh, just about to head on down for the tour, well, we just thought we'd show you a few little items inside here. Right outside the, uh, in the hall here is some beer. This uh, mask uh, breathing apparatus that the uh, miners wore. So they wouldn't be breathing in uh, dirty coal dust air down there. A big chunk of coal. Helmet. There's a lantern. Lunchbox. <laughs> Safety lamp used in the mine to test for methane gas and oxygen deficiency by the shock fire workers before setting off any explosives. <coughs> so, just head in and in and now show you a few things down in here. It's inside. Another breathing apparatus I used to use. That's what a miner looked like going down underground. Imagine wearing that all day long, eight or eight or a twelve hour shift. There's a tartan again, guys. That's our tartan. See what his is. Those Scottish have a tartan too, don't they? Yeah, this is it, guys. Uh, pictures. Coal mining began here on the island over 250 years ago. The first <coughs> guys to mine the coal here were the French soldiers, and they mined the coal by digging it out of our cliffs. We got 12 seams of coal. They're layered on top of one another, and <coughs> some of those seams of coal have cracked to the surface. Well, with the erosion of the Atlantic Ocean, that's how they got exposed. And when the French soldiers were out there and they were building the fortress of Louisburg, they were probably out doing a little bit of fishing, and they spotted it. And they went ashore and they dug it into the cliff and took it over to the fortress and they burned it. That was the very first mine we had called here. The first underground mine, well that was driven in 1720 uh, in a little fishing village. Today it's called Morian Bay. That mine is called a French mine and that mine, the coal was burnt at the fortress but the coal from that mine was exported off this island. So we've been mining coal and burning coal and exporting coal from that day right up until the year 2001, when all our coal mines called. <coughs> and we were out of the business here for over 15 years. One time here, there was over 12,000 coal miners here. There were 3,000 steel workers here. This little island one time was built on coal mines. And then all of a sudden it all shut down. And we were out of the business, like I said, for 15 years. Now, <coughs> a couple of years ago, uh, there was a company come in. There was two big tunnels that was driven here in the 80s, and they had never ever mined them. Uh, and a company came in and he went down and they looked at it, they done some tests and samples. Uh, that company wasn't too interested in it, that company was from Australia. Then another company came in, the next company 
company that come in is an American company, company and they're over there right now and they're actually buying coal again. So we're kind of back in the business again on a small scale. And it's about 150 guys over there working right now. Anyway, now, of course, when the mining started here first, well, it started out gradually and there wasn't, uh, you know, a uh, few little coal companies operating here, there, out around the island here. And they weren't doing that well. So they formed one big coal company. The coal company was called the Dominion Coal Company. When they took over, they opened up the coal mine big time here. Every little coast, all along the coast there, there would be a coal mine. This here little town here in Glades Bay, there were six or seven mines operating. Open down in Dominion, over in the waterfront, over on the north side, all along the coast. Lots of coal, lots of coal mines, but they never had enough men at the time. There wasn't that many people lived on the island here. So what they done, they started importing them in. We got every kind of coal, every kind of nationality you can think of is on the island here. And that's how they got here was through coal mining. And what they would do, or what they done, they would have ships going back and forth across the island, across the water. And on the other side, that's where they would have men over there. Hi folks, come on in, get yourself a hat on the wall over here, uh, and a cape here on the hook. Okay, the capes go on like a poncho. The hats can be adjusted. There's an adjustment <coughs> on the back, and you can tighten it up or loosen it up. Come right around and have a seat. Shaking on your head. So guys, while they were having their shift over there, they would have men on the wharf over there, and they'd be promoting and telling everybody and preaching and you know telling everybody what a beautiful little island to live on over there. We got all kinds of coal. We got a house for you to live on to live into. We got a job for you. They painted a nice big pretty picture for them. And of course, at that time, there was a lot of turmoil over there. And it didn't take too much convincing. All you had to do, well, you had to sign a contract that you were going to work for this company before you came across. And you signed your contract, you got onto a steamship, they took you across, and you landed here on the island. They set you all up, you got a house, you got a job, and you thought you had a pay. You go to work. You work six days a week, and you would work 12 hours a day. And of course, you'd be living in a house, you only rented it, you didn't own it. At payday, you'd go down to get your pay, they would give you a little brown envelope. You open up the envelope, and you look into it, there'd be a little white slip in there. And at the top of the slip, when you were reading it, it would tell you what mine you worked into. It would tell you how much coal you loaded for the week, how much money you made for the week, and then as you go down the slip, you're going to start seeing how much they took any of your money to pay. You're going to see the rent for your house. You need a coal to heat in your house. So you have to buy it from the coal company. Your electricity, they own it everything. Your water, they own it that. So when you get down to the bottom, anything you needed to mine the ton of coal, you would have to buy it. And of course, you'd have to buy it from the company store. So you needed a can of powder, Plastic powder, you need a shovel, okay? anything like that, you would have to buy it. They give you nothing. So you get down to the bottom of the slip, and of course you're going to see a big fat zero. And there'll be no money in it. <laughs> and you'll be shaking the pain and the envelope up looking for money. And be nothing into it, a very little. So what are you going to do? How are you going to feed your family? Well, what you have to do, they tell you, come on in their store. You don't need money. All you need is a check number. You go in the store, you give them your check number, and you could buy anything you need. And they had everything. They had food, they had clothes, they had furniture. All the prices were all escalated. Everything was out on display so you could see it. And you go in the store, and now you buy whatever you need for your family. And of course, you go to work, they would put it on the bill for you. Next week, when you go down and get your pay, you go down and slip again, and then at the bottom of the slip, you're going to see how much you owe at your store. Mm. And the next week, it's going to double. And the next week, it's going to triple. And you're going to go down that far in debt. You're not going to get any. And that's what they wanted. That's how they set it up. And that was their goal. And that was their tool to make sure that you're not going to complain. If you try to go out on strike or anything like that, the first thing they would do, you get up in the morning some morning, there'd be no water. Come on in, folks. Come on right in. Have a seat. Or they would shut your water off. Or they would shut your power off. 
Or you go to the coal yard trying to get some coal to heat your house, they wouldn't send you any coal. And that's what their tactics was, and that's how they treated the miners, to keep them from complaining. Of course, the government wouldn't help them, nobody would help them. Because, well, the government was getting a royalty after every ton of coal that was mined there. Those guys, that company, they leased the coal seams for 99 years, and they paid a royalty to the government on every ton of coal they mined. So the government wouldn't help them. In fact, one time here, the government even sent in troops with guns, machine guns, and forced the miners back underground when they were doing hmm. the strike. And, of course, and this was going on. And it wasn't uncommon back in them days for young boys to be working in the mines. And the young boys were as young as eight, nine, ten years old. Oh. Yeah, they were called trapper boys. And how they would get them, not be, they, didn't, they went in the mine not because they wanted to. They went in because they had to. Because, well, <clears throat> probably one day his father went to work and he got hurt. Or he got killed. And he couldn't work anymore. Well, when you moved in the house with your family, you signed a contract. And in the contract, it stated as long as you and the family live in the house, somebody from your family had to be in, in the, working in the pit at all times. If not, they would throw you and your family out on the street and move another family in. Okay. So they had their own police force. They controlled everything. And they'd come knocking on the door. And you'd tell the boys, go out, mother, hey, when your husband can't work anymore, you're going to get someone else. Uh, we're going to throw you out on the street. Well, what could the poor woman do? Well, if she was lucky enough and she knew somebody, a, a, a friend or a relative that she was willing to take in, uh, and they call them boarders. And he was willing to go to work and his check number would be attached to that house. She was allowed to stay. But if not, then they'd say, well, if you got a young boy in the family, we got jobs for them. So, he's in school. Well, she'd have to take him out of school. He'd be in school on Friday and in the pit on Monday. And you can see pictures today of the rakes going down in the deeps. And you see young boys going down in the rakes, and that's where they were going. They were going down to work. And then young boys were called trapper boys. They were paid 65 cents a day. When we go under around here today, I'm going to show you where his job was, what he had to do, and the conditions that he had to work on. Hi folks, how we doing? Good. Uh, you're going to need a hard hat first, right on the wall here, okay? And the hard hats can be adjusted, and over here on the hook is a cape, and they go on like a poncho. Where are you guys from? Uh, Washington, you're late on your first day on your job. How old is the young fella? Ten. Perfect age. Is he inter are you interested in a, in a job? We're hiring today. My father and my grandfather were miners here. Were they? Yes, they okay, were. Okay, so he got the blood in him. Yep. Okay, come on in then, son. We got, you're, you're hired. <laughs> you're going to work. You're going to be a trapper boy. You're going to work 12 hours a day, six <laughs> days a week, and you're going to get paid oh, 65 cents a day. Sound good? Can I, can I be on hire? <laughs> on hire. Can I be fired? Did you get fired? Uh, no, we don't fire. Go on in and have a seat, guys. So anyway, guys, now this is the way that things were operating here. We're just going to stop the baby getting all done. And of course, it was pretty tough. And it was hard. And it was hard. Every other day, you see somebody getting called up on the track. Of course, this was going on and on. Now, around 1920, this company merged with another company called Besco, British Empire and Steel Company. And of course, when they took over the mines, well, they were worse than the first company. The first mm -hmm. year in operation, they wanted to cut the miners' wages by 33 and a third percent. And of course, well, like I told you before, they would go out on strike or they would complain and uh, nobody would help them and the government wouldn't help them. Nobody would do anything for them. And they'd be out and they would shut the coal yard down on them. They'd shut their water off. They'd shut their power off. They did all that. They used to have a saying. They used to say, hey, it's like a poker game. Only we hold all the cards. They can't stay in the gap because we own everything. And, uh, well, it came to a point here that the miners decided to go out and stay out. 
because it was pretty tough. And they went out in 1925. There was a big strike there. And all the miners went out, and they were out for several months. But they went out in the winter time. Of course, it gets pretty cold here in the winter time. Well, when they went to the coal yard to get some coal to heat in their houses, the company was at to shut the coal yards down. And they wouldn't sell wind coal. So, you know what the miners done? They started making their own pits right in their backyard. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> these come bootleg pits. They didn't have to go down that far. They only had to go down 10 or 12 feet, and they were in the coal seams. So they would hoist the coal up, and they'd pass it around, and they'd give it to their friends and their family and everything. Well, they stayed warm for the winter, but they were still pretty hungry. And then around the spring, around March, the, well, the shipping lanes are now open. The company now wants to start uh, moving coal. So <coughs> the miners, what they done, they said, hey, we're going to pull out the pumps when they the pit and we're going to let the pit flood. And when they done that, well in retaliation, what the company did, they shut the power off in a whole town, in the little town of Nwadaport, not far from here. Yeah. And that power was there for weeks. The whole town was in darkness, there was no water, no power, hospital in town, people in sick, people in the hospital, and they wouldn't turn that power on. The mayor tried to get the power restored, everybody tried, and they wouldn't listen. No, nope, we're not turning the power on until the miners go back to work. Well, they were pretty stubborn. They said, we're not going back to work. So they decided to go up to the power plant and get the power turned on themselves. But when they landed up there, well, they landed up there, they were met by company cops. Now, you know who the company cops were? They were crooks that were in jails in Halifax. That they took out of the jails, put a uniform on them, gave them a gun, and told them to go to Cape Breton Island. When they landed up there that morning, of course they started firing shots at them. <laughs> Three miners were hit, and one miner was killed. And his name was William Davis. And that happened That's on June 11, 1925. Of course, That's a holiday. he left behind a wife and nine kids. And she was pregnant at the time. Well, they retreated. Well, <clears throat> they were outnumbered, I guess, or outshot. But the word got around all the other little towns after that. And when all the other miners from the other little towns heard about it, they went over to that town to help them. And they were back up to the power plant. When they got up there this time, they got a hold of the cops and they hauled them out of the town. And they fired them out the That night, when it got dark, they went into the stores and they started robbing them. They stole everything out of them, they could get out, and when they got everything out, they burnt them. They went in and they torched them, and burnt them to the ground. That was the end of the company stores. Them stores never ever reopened after that. And them stores controlled the miners. They hated them, they used to call them the Puckney stores. Because they controlled them by not giving them credit, making sure that they were in debt all the time. And you know what, another trick that the company used to have? Well, if you were, were dealing with this store and all of a sudden you started seeing things getting a little better and you started bringing your bill down, they would watch it, okay? And say the store here in Glace Bay, miners start to commit the red, they're starting to get a little gain a little bit. You know what they do? They'd shut that mine down. And that mine would be down for a month because they had so many, they didn't need them all, so they shut that mine down. And now you were out of work for a month. Well, you got to eat, so you have to go back to the store and drive up the bill again. And that's how they control Well, anyway, that night, when they went in them stores, they torched them and burnt them off. And of course, for several nights later, the whole island down here was in a turmoil. Every night, one of them stores were being burnt. And the company, now the government had a look at it and said, hey, we better do something, we better go down there. They're gone crazy down there. Well, then they sent in a negotiating team. They negotiated a six month contract with them to get them back underground. And they never get much, much out of it. But anyway, <clears throat> they went back underground. And they swore, we're going underground, but we will never ever mine another pound of coal on June the 11th again. And next year, when June the 11th rolled around, they didn't go to work, they went over to that town and they went to service. And they had went to church and had a service for William Davis. And from that year on, every year, 
through the service. Today we call it Miner's Memorial Day. Back in them days, it was called William Davis Day. And <clears throat> we had that service this year, right here in the Civil Museum. But anyway, that ended the company stores, and that pretty well ended that company. And you know, I read a few stories about it, and I read a funny story about it. That night, of course, when they went into them stores, well, it was pitch black. Okay, yeah. You couldn't see anything was dark. And you went into And we're off, people. The start of the tunnel. Stuck we down, down here. Case, like I told you, down to what we call the fifth bottom. And what we'll be waiting for is would be little wooden boxes like those here. Okay? And it'd be 25 of them. Maybe I'll connect it together. Took us in a long tunnel. <coughs> now we are out to where we call the deeps. This here would be a deep or a slope that you're looking down here. And on this deep, there would be about 20 of those boxes. They'd be all connected together. Now, in a real operating mine, a deep like this air, you would be about four of them, okay? And the air will go down, two of them, fresh air, and on the return side, the other two would be return air coming up. The trips usually ran on the fresh air side, okay? So it would be about 20 of those, and they'd be all connected together. The last one would have a big rope on it. Everybody would get those boxes and see them sitting there. And one guy would be the chain runner, okay? That was his job, because he made sure everybody could see When everybody got seated, he would walk down, and he would sit up on the last box there. And he'd put his hand in the air, you'd see him hollering, and you'd hear him hollering. Right down, and he'd pull out a little cord. That cord would run down the whole length of the deep. And what he was doing, he would send the signal up to the hoist room. Now the hoist operator, he's the guy that actually ran the trip. And when he would hear a little bell, here's what he would hear. And if he'd two for down, three for up, one would stop if he'd hear motion. Okay, that was the code of signals. It's still the same code of signals today. So those trips never move unless that's on her belt. Because he couldn't see it. He wouldn't see you, you wouldn't see him. He just sitting in a the chair there with the controls and he's going by that bell. Right? So he hears the bell going ding ding. He takes the brake off. You're sitting in the box. You're gonna feel a little jerk first. And then he's gonna put the power on the engine. He's gonna throw slacks on the rope. And now she's gonna start away. And it's gonna start away and a little slow. And then it's gonna go over her brow. And when she goes over the brow, she's gone and she's going down like a little roller coaster it wasn't nice and flat like here her deeps were up on end and they were like this air going down of course there was no big bright lights like you see here well you're going to <coughs> look right behind you there there uh, there's a white switch there just click that off for a minute yeah but that there's what it would look like going down and this is the only light you would have with this one here yeah. and you wouldn't have that on because you don't want to burn that up before you get down there okay so, and you say, you know what, you get used to it, of course you do. 30, 30 years, you gotta get used to it, it's, you're doing some day after day after day. But then some things happen as you're going down. I know a couple of times I was in it going down, and you'd be going down, and then all of a sudden something happened to the engine up there. They lose the power on it. Well, the engine stops, but this thing got no brakes. That's gonna keep going until it stretch that rope that can't stretch anymore. And it's gonna come down to a quick stop. You're sitting in this box, you might land over into the next box. So it's gonna stop that fast. And then the rope now won't stretch, so now it's gonna be like a bungee cord. It's gonna shoot back up the deep, and you're gonna be going up and down like this here for a few times. Your old stomach's gonna be going up and down too. And you're gonna be saying, Will I jump out of it? What do I do? I might hit the wall and bounce in underneath it, so I gotta stay with it. And you're going to hope that rope don't break. Because every time she gives a jerk, you say, uh oh. But anyway, and you know what? You know when it used to be the worst? On Monday morning, when you're out partying all weekend, <laughs> your stomach is not the best. <laughs> and you know what? Sometimes them engineers, I think they used to do that just eventually. They give you a little, you know, and you're going down. Right? So then you get down there, you get out, and then you go in and do your work. And then at the end of the day, just try to take you back up again. And while you're in there working, 
of course, they're going to put the coal boxes on. Now they're going to haul coal up and down all day long. So, but when you're going down in the rake in the morning, uh, there's going to be another one coming that up, okay? It's a double track. So you're going to meet another one coming up. And on the other one coming up, sometimes, it's going to be the back ship. So we're day shift going down, the back ship is coming up. And that would stop sometimes. And the guys were going to give you a little verbal report on what's going on because you're going in on the wall that them guys are just coming off of, okay? So they give you a little, like, what you bag roll for, gassy tonight, guys, be careful. They give you a little verbal, a little heads up. And I guarantee you, before that trip leaves, especially if it's in the wintertime, somebody's going to holler over and ask you, how's the weather up there? Because they don't know how the weather is. <laughs> well, you know what you're going to tell them. Well, guys, it's storming, it's snowing when you went to pit last night, and it's still storming up there, and they don't think you're going to get home. You're going to have to spend the day in the washroom to get your shovels ready. You lay it right on them, <laughs> right? And they're going up the deep sand house. You're like, I'm going to stay in the washroom. But when they get up there, it's beautiful. If there's not a flight down, they never say they're flying past. We get them tomorrow night when we're going down. The way there, the odds put up big when you're underground. Mm -hmm. Just don't pay any attention to it. Okay, guys, let's move down. Now I was here the other day and I said the same thing and we just stepped in there and this woman hollered up and she said are we under the ocean yet and I said no dear and we went down a little bit farther and she hollered up again she said are we under the ocean yet and I said no dear a little bit farther the third time she said we got to be under the ocean now and I said yes dear we are I just heard the Newfoundland ferry going by <laughs> and just then the pump come on and she said yes I can hear it I can hear it I said, okay. she under the ocean. as I told you you wouldn't know the difference <laughs> okay? So anyway guys, we're going to move down a little bit further. <laughs> now, if you look in here guys, uh, I told you we're going in the room with pillar. Well this would be the main room going in as you're looking in there. And two miners would have driven this room in. And when they get in there about 50 feet, two other miners would take another room off of this one. They drive one up and one down, and they would leave a block of coal between each room, and that's called a pillar. And then pillars were left to support the roof. Like you, you got to do it systematically. You just can't come down and start taking coal from everywhere, or you're going to have nothing but falls. Okay. Now, uh, the long while mining. Uh, my days of mining mostly was long while mining. You, they would drive this room in here about a mile or two miles, and go down below a thousand feet and drive another one. And they connect the two of them up inside. And now you'd have a big coal face, about 1,000 feet long. You put your shear around it, your walking jacks on it, and all your equipment. And then 12 guys could go in there and they could mine anywhere from two to 3,000 tons of coal to shift. Okay? But the little room of pillars, they would be loading coal in there. They'd get about six, seven boxes out of each little room. And the room of pillar, you're going to leave about 40% of your coal. You're a long walk. Here. You're going to be underneath those jacks. And you're going to hear this. You thought you heard thunder. You never heard thunder. You never, never wouldn't hear it until you heard this here. And it should be rumbling and rolling, and then big slabs of stone would start coming in. And if you're working out to where you are, and you'll be underneath this jack, and you know what you'll be saying, Dear God, don't let this jack come down and crush me to death. Hope she breaks off. But she usually breaks off just behind you, and then you go again. So you have some scary days. But anyway. But anyway, guys, we're going to work our way down a little further. Approaching down here now. It's four feet high. It's a little four feet high. It's a little four feet high. Anybody else, Kev? Yeah. Now, <clears throat> just down below down here, guys, there's, uh, that's where this mine stops at, okay? And that's where the ocean starts. We're just about down to the cliff down there. We got a little pump down there, and pumps up the water, okay? 
Every mine uh, has to have one of your deep scouts. Of course, the company we're working for today, uh, they're going to take the coal. They can't sell stone, so they're not going to mine it. And they didn't care if you were all bent over. I think of that, so, Now, like some of the mines were different heights. Every mine was different. Like this in here, with what you Kirk's see here. here. Now, we had one that was six feet. We had a seam that was nine feet. We also mined one that was only three feet. So it was all depends on how the thickness of the coal seam was. And as you can see, I told you today, come right now before we go in. Uh, the last person there, would you make sure that door is closed there, please? Now, anybody have any questions before we go in? I was here that other day, that same crew that I had. This it's a four feet high from the floor to the ceiling. It's cold, it's wet. So, uh, I'm just coming in some light in here. Give you a little view. There's, uh, there's quite a few of us in the group. Hopefully, uh, quite a few of us in the group. Hopefully, uh, we don't get collapsed on too. So yeah, guys, I'm going to stop it here, and uh, we'll continue on up ahead a bit again. See you in a bit. Okay, uh, just to show you guys, uh, there used to be pit ponies in here, uh, just to give you an idea. Yeah. They had horses down here. Fred, yeah. Now, guys, this area would be how big the horses would be. This is to be the box that he would have to take out. Yep. Of course, the box weighed a ton, and it held two tons. So the, the horse will take the, the full one out, bring the empty in, and the miners will load another one out again. So this would be the go all day long. Of course, well, they didn't uh, go by themselves. They had to be led in and out. And you know who that would be? The boys, when they got a bit older and they got in their teens, they could get around the mine by themselves. Now, guys, this here would be a typical little room. I told you we're going in a room of pillar type mine. Well, this here would be the room, okay? And uh, in this little room right here, there'll be two miners. And uh, they would be working together. Now, you pick your own buddy because you're on contract. And some guys work together for 20, 25 years together. So you come down here in the morning. The first thing you, well, I know what I and my buddy used to do. We would sit down on a piece of coal probably and open up our lunch can and have a quick sandwich out of our lunch can. And while we're having our lunch, uh, you're going to see a guy coming through. He's got a lock clean safety lens. He's called a mine examiner. He's going to come in and come check the place out and make sure. Lots of seats up there, guys. Some lights over here. A little underground garden. Oh. Okay, we'll go down that way. It's a little chilly down here. Yes. A little chilly, yeah. And then, uh, I'll catch you back in a bit. Continuing on, guys. I think the tour is just about over. Oh, yeah. I think we're heading out right from. <laughs> I actually got to show you a coal mine. Uh, I thought it was pretty interesting. Me too. What did you guys think? I thought it was Or like that. Yeah, we're, uh, we're over. We're heading our way out. Watch your head, baby. I'm going to watch those main beams. So, what does the, uh, what do the YouTubers think of this? Why do we stand up now? Oh, that's so much fun. The miners are going to go to tour. I could not do that for 12 I didn't catch every single thing that, uh, that he was talking about because I'm running out of storage space. Using a good camera. But yeah, it's, uh, it's very interesting, guys. The money you paid. Uh, yeah. She never had time to go over. She had to raise the family. And yeah, it was, it was, yeah. It was great fun. So, yeah. But anyway, guys, we'll, uh, I'll just give you a little history on this little mine here. This here was never a real operating mine, but there was an actual uh, block of coal that was left here. And there was a lady in town, and her name was Nina Cohn. And one day she had the idea and she said, someday there's not going to be any coal mines in Cape Breton Island, so let's make a little museum. So they hired five retired coal miners and they come over and drove it and set it all up. The coal was extracted from here. They extracted 5,000 tons of coal, took them 14 months to do it. And the coal went to the power plant. The money came back in here. They got some funding from the government, from the town. And they opened up in 1967. 
and it's going ever since. And of course, it's people like you that keeps visiting us that keeps it going now. So, so guys, got a lot of friends about us there, guys. So, so they have some visitors and keep showing here and not in the kitchen, we, you know. And, we, we, anyway, we, guys, uh, and, and that was the same year that the Minister of the Choir was these minds open, we, we, we have to have some tourism and uh, pay for this stuff. Anyway. Anyway, guys, we're really thank you guys it's for nice coming to today. See. I appreciate you being your guy. Hope you all enjoy the tour and hope you all have a safe trip back to your city. Thank you very much, guys. So, so, guys, I already had this thing recorded. But I didn't have my memory card on my phone and I ran out of storage space. I, I was down in the mine. I had to delete some videos. These were the ones I had to delete. So I'm going to run through them right, uh, right quick myself here while Laura's in the car waiting. She's really got a sore back after the mine being bent over. But yeah, there's a uh, company house here I want to show. And uh, the... Uh, company store so I'll just show you guys that before we get out of here this is actually the company house this is what the miners used to live in too it'd be a family in each side so show it off a little bit I really wish I had known that the phone takes an SD card but uh a little different than the last, so yeah. See, this is uh, this is half of the company house. Fireplace there would have heated this whole side, and they have an upstairs for this side. And both sides were connected, so I guess you would uh, be living with the other family, and uh, you know, one bedroom. Here's a second. Have a pot belly fire fireplace up there, stove. This is the other side of the company house. Remember downstairs, so there's two sides. I just come upstairs, and now I'm over the other side. <coughs> As I said, they're both connected, and that's pretty strange like that, eh? Downstairs there. But I, I won't go down that way. I'll go down the way I came up, and I'll go around and show you. There's the other bedroom. In here. Everything in here is antique. Every single bit of this. So yeah, I uh, just come up this set of stairs. So back down the same set I came up. And I'll go through. Here, see? Page into the other, the other uh, side of the house. See, and there's the stairs. I was up there looking down. Yeah, see that? It's a little bed in the kitchen. Uh, there's a pantry in here. The pantry. Well, it's your washing machine, I guess. There's a nice stove, guys. Uh, I'd actually like to have something like that in my home. Touch the artifacts. I'll, uh, I'll leave her name here.
then we get out of here and I'll show you the little old company store. There's a restaurant right there you can eat into. store and look around them we'll head out. Oh, this is pretty cool. I uh, terribly sorry I had to leave it the first time. Like I say I really needed the room or I wouldn't have got the rest of the mine. But now I have the card on the phone so I can record pretty much whatever I want. I've got a 32 gig card. Three and a third percent wage cut in 1922. Imagine for 290, 290 days they made seven hundred and seven dollars. Yeah. Automatic deductions off of every pay. Like the miner said, guys, by the time they got their pay, they owed money to the company, and they were they were coming to this company store. Getting their food and still owing the company money. There's a, there's a week's pay stub. $31.99 for a week. $27.09. $17.97. The highest one here, a week's pay. $32, uh, 30, $32 guys. Thirty-two forty-nine is the highest someone was paid in a week. Can you imagine living off of that? And there's a gift shop here. That's a good ass. So, like I say, I wish I hadn't have uh, deleted it the first time, but I really needed the room. And uh, there's a little. Uh, <laughs> little, uh, little park on the other side of the building with the uh, some machinery and stuff there. Uh, I think I deleted that one too. So I'll take a quick gander over there. I'll show you that stuff before I head out of here. So what did you guys think of the mine? We'd love to know. Especially Mr. Wonderboy Jeremy. That's something you've probably never seen before. Or may never see again, unless you come here. So guys, here's the uh, machinery I was talking about. This is stuff they used to use in the mine to process and bring the coal out. Imagine the big wheel is uh, to pull the carts back up. There you go, there's, uh, there's some machinery for the mine cart and a couple of digging machines for pulling the coal out of the ground. This is like a little bulldozer, they had that down underground. Machinery for chopping the uh, coal of the walls. And that over there is the uh, for exchanging air, bring clean air in, take the dusty air out. And there's this cool little rig. Holds four people, two in each end. It's pretty cool, eh, guys? What do you think? What do you think of this stuff? And there's a view off of the uh, point here. This is Glace Bay. This place is pretty close to the hospital. If you're heading towards the hospital, it's a street on the left. I just can't remember the name of the street right away. I'll uh, probably post it in the comments. 
it's it's actually not hard to find anyway guys there's only uh it's like the third or fourth street from on the left as you're heading towards the hospital third or fourth street before you hit the hospital so it's not hard to find some machinery and stuff over there and uh memorial that's what the place looks like memorial park that's what it was so as i said we'll uh we'll end this here now and uh we'll catch you guys on the flip side until next time guys see you later